I'm Dr. Ravi Shankar, and uh, in October of 2021, later this year, I have a memoir correctional coming out, and it's a, a story about my parents' immigration, about some unexpected encounters I had with the criminal justice system. It's about mass media. Uh, it's about living through 9-11, a, a number of different things. And I was asked by the Marshall Project to just write a, a, a little essay about some of the experiences that went into uh, to this memoir. And so I want, wanted to share this with you. This is from the Marshall Project series, Life Inside, where they have different people who have been affected by the criminal justice system. Everyone from people who are currently incarcerated to prosecutors to correctional officers, all writing testimonials so that uh, we can see what really happens uh, in, uh, inside of jails. Because of course, prisons are built not just to keep people in, but to keep the public out. And so this little essay of mine is called, Nothing Has Made Me Feel More American Than Going to Jail. I was born in DC to South Indian parents, but it wasn't until I had to negotiate the criminal justice system that I fully realized what many Americans of color have to deal with. And of course, we realized that the, the US incarcerates 25% of the world's population, more than China and North Korea and Iran combined. And then when you look at the racial demographic of who's incarcerated, it becomes uh, even more disturbing. So nothing has made me feel more American than going to jail. Hartford Correctional Center, or HCC, is located on an urban stretch near car dealerships, fast food restaurants, a seedy looking motel, and an enormous post office. Driving by, you might not even notice it, except for the glinting barbed wire encircling the grounds. As an English professor at Central Connecticut State University and someone who had lived in six countries, I never expected that HTC would become one of my homes. But then I violated my probation for a misdemeanor by driving on a suspended license. I was sentenced to 90 days of pretrial detention to satisfy the state. Whenever I hear that phrase, satisfy the state, I visualize the fanged Hindu goddess Kali with her long lulling tongue, flailing multiple arms and wearing a necklace of decapitated human heads. I think of a goddess who needs to be propitiated with human sacrifice. Probably make that association because I'm a Tamilian Brahmin American whose parents emigrated from South India in the late 1960s. Though I was born in Washington, D.C., and I've largely benefited from the very systems of discrimination that I would later suffer, I haven't always felt like an American. As it turns out, nothing made me feel more American than being incarcerated. Before I went to jail, I was peripherally aware that our criminal justice system tilts the axis of power towards those who create the laws and exert political influence. But it was not until I had to personally negotiate the criminal justice system that I fully realized what many Americans of color have to deal with on a regular basis. HCC, according to the Department of Corrections website, is a level four high security urban jail that holds primarily pretrial offenders. While I heard that this is not the place where hardened criminals go to do real time, I was petrified. I'd watched the fictional TV show Oz and knew about the real life abuse that Khalif Browder endured on Rikers Island. What I didn't expect was to be admitted around midnight. I was led down a brightly lit hallway into a gymnasium where I would join a mass of human beings in jagged rows. A few of the men were wrapped in blankets like corpses. Others were on their mattresses shivering or having what looked like seizures. Some men were huddled together or gesturing in the air with inscrutable resolve. Others were splayed out, prone and eerily motionless. I received a flame retardant mattress in a gray plastic boat, a stackable bunk without any parts that could be weaponized. And I anchored among a hundred other men. I couldn't imagine that this was legal under the city's fire code, but apparently it was common practice. Exhausted, I spread my sheet and blanket atop the mattress and rolled an extra t-shirt into a lumpy pillow. The gym, which was still lit despite the late hour, looked like a makeshift shelter from nuclear fallout. 
From where I lay, I could see an unfinished mural with half of the Connecticut State Seal and its Latin motto, Qui translucit sustinit, he who transplanted sustains. Some see the state's motto as positive evidence of rugged Yankee individualism. But it reminded me of the violent displacement of the indigenous people by early Puritan settlers. These settlers used public whippings, brandings, dunkings, pillory, mutilation, and even execution to enforce a legal code that made little distinction between religious and criminal transgression. In time, reformers moved away from the brutality of the scaffold to the silence of imprisonment. By design, prisons don't allow the public to see what transpires inside. On the first of 90 days I would spend incarcerated, I was transplanted, but not sustained. I only needed to look down at my laminate ID clipped to my prison tans to know my outside credentials no longer mattered. Nonetheless, I had relative privilege. My pretrial detention was stretched out over a year to allow me to work, an option I only had because I could afford a private attorney. In retrospect, I would have preferred to do the 90 days in one stretch. Each time I had to spend a holiday break coughing, spreading my ass cheeks, and putting on ill-fitting tans in front of correctional officers who called me Big Bang Theory, I was humiliated and dehumanized and traumatized anew. And inside HCC, I found little hope for rehabilitation or effective re-entry assistance. Books were systematically removed from our dorm, medical requests were ignored, and there was a casual sadism that pervaded everyday life. It was meant to destabilize and confuse the incarcerated population and actively prevent healthy integration. For example, there was a basketball court where one hoop was eight inches higher than the other, which practically ensured that any full court game would result in a skirmish and someone getting written up. Breakfast was served around 6 a.m., lunch at 10.30, and dinner at 4 in the afternoon. By the time evening rec rolled around, everyone would be ravenous. Staff opened our letters and confiscated our photographs, even if they were of a son or daughter on their first day of school. One CO responsible for assisting those with mental health issues would announce a shift by trumpeting, Screws and schizos, come get your skittles! Many of the men I met inside had mental health and drug problems, but they didn't belong in prison. Outside, their families were suffering. Inside, many were just becoming more hardened. Still, the most difficult time in my life was a blessing in disguise. Had I not been incarcerated, I would never have met those men or seen firsthand the maddening conditions in which they lived. Their reflections, which I share in my forthcoming memoir, Correctional, were heartbreaking and profound and enraging. I also saw the difficulty that previously incarcerated people have in finding employment and moving forward with their lives. In my brief time inside the glinting jaws of the prison industrial complex, I didn't experience any trace of a goddess, but I did feel the digestive pressure of an institutional organ designed to make invisible the men and women traveling through its intestines. I also saw astonishing resilience redemption and the possibility of growth. It made me certain that personally, collectively, legally, and ethically, we must aspire for a far better solution, policing our communities and redressing harm. Punishment and incarceration are red herrings that prevent us from understanding the historical, economic, and racial roots of mass incarceration and the system's role not in preventing crime, but in perpetuating trauma and social inequity.